We're very happy to have so many of us who have joined here today for the second session of the series, Race and Migration, Scholarship in Between, On and Beyond the Borders, where we invite scholars who work at the intersections of race and migration studies um, in Europe in innovative ways. This series is hosted by um, ACES, the Amsterdam Center for European Studies in collaboration with the Institute for Migration and Ethnic Studies and convened by Eline Vestra, my colleague, and myself, Sonja evalson Melström, who work here at the University of Amsterdam. Our guests tonight are Amadem Charek and Tobias Vidinet. And present tonight, we also have Saskia Bonjour, who will be moderating. Amadem Charek is professor of anthropology of science at the University of Amsterdam where her research explores the intersection of science and society, particularly focusing on forensics, forensic anthropology and race. Tobias Hubinet is associate professor in intercultural education at Karlstad University in Sweden. His research explores Swedish critical race and whiteness studies, as well as adoption, migration, minorities, Korea, Asians and Swedishness. And our moderator, Saskia Bonjour, is Associate Professor in Political Science at the University of Amsterdam, where her research focuses on the politics of family migration, civic integration, gender and migration and Europeanization. So welcome to the series, uh, Amade and Tobias, who hopefully we will very shortly have on screen. Uh, and also welcome Saskia and thank you for moderating and thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, and with these words, I hand over to Saskia uh, to uh, moderate this conversation. So best of luck, and we are very excited to hear this conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonia and Eline, for creating this space for us to have this conversation, which indeed I really hope that Tobias will be able to join uh, soon. Um, so perhaps many of you in the audience tonight uh, know from experience that it's not always easy to study race and migration together. You can encounter all kinds of different uh, obstacles and resistance from, from colleagues, from your institution, from journals or conference organizers. And um, we thought it was important to address um, such obstacles directly. And we thought it was especially important to do so since um, this lecture series is hosted by the University of Amsterdam. And the University of Amsterdam is marked by its own loaded history when it comes to the study of, of race and racism and uh, migration. Um, perhaps also again, some of you know, some of you might not know that in 1984, um, a Center for Race and Ethnic Studies was founded at the University of Amsterdam. It was founded by uh, Professor Chris Mullard, who was perhaps the first black professor of ethnic studies uh, in Europe. Um, this center uh, focused on critical race and post-colonial uh, theories and approaches, and it housed such uh, uh, renowned Dutch critical race scholars as Gloria Wecker and Philomena Esset. Um, the center only existed for seven years. In 1991, it was discontinued. Um, it was the, the faculty of pedagogy where it was originally housed, uh, no longer uh, wished to house it. And apparently there was no other faculty at the University of Amsterdam uh, willing to um, integrate the center. And then shortly after the Center for Race and Ethnic Study was abolished, a new center was uh, founded, the Institute for Migration and Ethnic Studies. Um, the founder was uh, Rina Spennings, uh, a Dutch a white scholar. Um, EMS became a major center for the study of migration and ethnic studies um, with uh, very successful at, at gaining uh, funding, including uh, government funding with a strong focus on the study of uh, so-called ethnic minorities and later on uh, so-called uh, migrant uh, integration. Um, very little critical race or post-colonial perspectives in the, in the work of the, of the EMS, uh, certainly in its heydays in the, in the 1990s and 2000s. Um, now, EMS still exists. It co-funds this event today. Um, it is no longer uh, directed by uh, white professors. 
um, it is also no longer um, so much oriented to, uh, to policy uh, research. Um, but the University of Amsterdam still until today does not have a, a study, a center for the, for the study of race or racism. Um, so knowing where we come from, in particular at UVA, um, we wanted to talk about where we are and where we want to go. Um, and we uh, are particularly grateful to be able to, to do so with Ahmad and Charek and uh, hopefully soon also with Tobias Rubinet, who are two scholars who have some experience in, uh, in different ways in working to bridge uh, race and migration studies. Amara, I think we'll just start the two of us and then, <laughs> and then, and then uh, welcome Tobias whenever he's able to, uh, to join the conversation. Um, so glad to have you. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. Thank you, Saskia and uh, Sonia. Thank you for the introduction, also for this event. And Tobias, I really, really hope to see you here and to have the conversation. Yes. Looking forward to it. Um, could you say something, uh, perhaps also for, for people in the audience who don't know your work yet, um, about how and why you, you study race? Oh, good. Uh, um, yeah, well, it has now quite a, a genealogy, so to speak, a long history. Um, I, I mean, I, I have been interested in uh, the sciences and, uh, and the impact of the sciences on society for quite some time, in particular in, in genetics and uh, um, things as genetic diversity, human genetic diversity, where we come from, where we go to, how we relate to one another. And I started actually to be very intrigued with the concept of diversity, and I have been uh, working into that, uh, onto that quite a bit. Uh, but then moving from, say, a laboratory context, where I have been doing my research as an anthropologist, as an STS, Science and Technology Studies anthropologist, uh, following this uh, diversity and genetic diversity around, so to say, uh, medical practice and other practices, I started to notice that where diversity was used, people actually were thinking or acting as if we were talking about race. And I found that really problematic in the context of uh, Europe, but specifically in the Netherlands, where race is typically uh, unspoken of. It's not a word that you hear uh, also lightly, you know, when you, somebody says ras, it's, it's quite strong. Um, well, and that combined with um, having uh, been housed at the Spin House since 2008, well, then we moved, of course, to Rutherstraat. Uh, but in a spin house, we had these uh, very interesting uh, prints uh, of anthropological faces in, in the Porter's uh, Lounge, uh, very famous. Uh, the, these are um, uh, prints from uh, uh, a physical anthropologist who they were really designed to teach people how to learn to uh, people, that is physical anthropologists, how to, um, uh, to see races and how to distinguish between them. So we have a space where these spaces and this legacy of race is there. Uh, we have a setting where we can't talk about uh, race mm -hmm. and uh, my uh, anxieties or uneasiness with talking about diversity because it has such a beautiful and, and positive lure to it. So that really started to bring up and uh, I felt, um, well, sort of invited uh, uh, by uh, the problem of race and starting to look into it. Mm. And what, what has it been like? Want, uh, wanting to study this thing that, that you almost can't speak, like yeah. uh, um, for you, like what? And uh, it's it's an ongoing nervousness. So really, I find myself between uh, well, maybe uh, a taboo is not that bad. Maybe we should not talk about race. I'm, I'm not talking about racism. Huh? I'm talking about race as an object of study, uh, because I mean, what I do and what we have been doing in in this uh, large project, race face ID project, is really a quest interrogating what is race. So the the presumption is that race is among us. It's not a history left behind. It is not that these faces that were hanging in a spin house. That's not history, but it resonates, and we are still making all sorts of categories and 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 uh, uh, clusters of people assuming that they have some kind of biological, some kind of cultural unity uh, that uh, helps you to understand their behavior, helps you to understand how they tick. Uh, so this, and the way we do that is quite intriguing and I find it, found it important to 
to raise that question. So what does, how does race come about in specific practices? Uh, what do we bring together? What kind of cultural, biological, so, uh, um, uh, psychological elements, so to speak, from now and the past, so to speak, how do they bring them together? And, and, and how does it become convincing? How does it become a convincing category or a category that could do some work? Because this is what we see happening in medical practice, for example. Race is a very, very uh, interesting category for many scientists. Mm -hmm. And um, working on race at UVA and in the Netherlands, has that been, is there, is that, has that been a specific kind of experience for you? I think, so um, I am really happy that I have not been one of these um, uh, and that's happened to many colleagues, um, somebody who has been bashed on social media or something like that. Uh, I don't know what, how does, uh, so I'm happy that there is still some kind of calmness in which uh, we can do this work uh, on uh, questioning what race is made to be. Um, but I, I am investing quite some uh, work and time in um, finding the right words in how to phrase things. So um, uh, at a certain moment, um, um, the work that we are doing started to be become has a place in the media, right? So there are interviews or things. So and I'm really very uh, keen on doing this very precisely. So, uh, you know, with journalists, I want to read it and I'm editing the text just to make sure that things are transported or mediated in, um, in, in a way that I find uh, fitting to this very problematic object you know i don't want to give the impression uh that race exists just like that uh that race is uh, uh, um, without this history a useful category to be uh, applied it, it race is not to be applied race is to be thought with to to think with and to be problematized mm -hmm. um so that was that and within the UVA it has not been uh uh, I mean, you were referring to this history, institutional histories. We have a more recent institutional history as well here. Mm -hmm. As uh, you know, when we started another research center, uh, Amsterdam Research Center for Gender and Sexuality, I mean, I was approached to become the director. I was actually in the committee preparing the center and I was also very nice. And I uttered, well, why not uh, um, uh, call it a center for race, gender and sexuality? So to, to introduce this problem as, as a connected problem to gender and sexuality well that could not be done so there was really it, it was not that relevant it was not that big an issue and uh, and that was that was reason why i did not want to become the first director of that institute so you see um the, the problems that you were raising like we don't it's it race is a category of part is a problem of part that we would like to put in one corner and not to connect up with our other concerns, uh, research concerns, institutional concerns. So um, it is an uneasy relation still, but uh, yeah. Yeah. And you've, uh, you've worked on migration also over, over the years. Uh, you're, you're, I love your work um, on, on borders and on, on categories and on the, um, um, so um, and this is a this is a lecture series on migration studies and race studies. So I wondered whether you could share some of your thoughts on how how migration studies, as you see it, relates to the study of race and, and whether and how it should. Um, well, Saskia, let me just um, one caveat. I'm I'm not a migration studies expert, right? So I'm just. Uh, yeah, I'm sort of flirting. <laughs> You're an outsider. <laughs> you have a little bit of knowledge. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, no, just to be to, just to be sure. So um, yes, I've been. Hey, there's Tobias. But good, good. Um, I mean, what is what are my reflections? I think I think the so a very uh, crude observation is, of course, that the issue of race and racism. Uh, uh, putting it on the agenda, making it into a scholarly uh, um, object of research has a different genealogy than uh, migration, 
for migration studies, right? So uh, race and racism uh, um, cannot be disconnected from social movements, from uh, uh, anti-racist movements, from uh, uh, decolonial and, and, uh, and anti-colonial uh, movements. So it has this history of activism uh, uh, and this maybe almost in written in sort of uh, um, a reflexive uh, question mark, question mark, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and this is different for migration and the migrants. This is, I, I would say, predominantly um, a problem. <laughs> the migrant is a problem, and it has been become a, specifically a problem in the Netherlands. Problematized the problem groupen beleid um, of doelgroepen beleid. Um, it, 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 it's it's a, it's a concern of the state. So you have actually uh, activism and social movement versus the eye of the state that wants to govern its, its, its system, which is a normal activity of states, obviously. Uh, so they have different kind of genealogies. And that makes it interesting, this conversation that we are having now. Like, you know, how do they clash? And uh, uh, what is the good of, of this, this state <laughs> eye <laughs> or the, 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 the genealogy of migration? How can it be worked with? and uh, uh, tweaked and uh, yeah, adjusted. Thanks. I'll get back to that in a second. But first, Tobias, can you uh, can we hear you? Can you hear us as well? Yeah, I can hear you and I hope you hear me now. Oh, that's wonderful, Tobias. I, I think we lose the visuals uh, when you speak. OK, sorry. Yeah, no. maybe. You now hear me now? Works. Do you hear now? Yes, perfectly. OK, good. It's really great to have you. I was just yeah. asking Ahmad, and maybe you can say something also about um, how and why you you study race, just for the those in the audience who don't know your work yet. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm a Swedish researcher, and I'm uh, pretty much active uh, trying to establish a critical race and whiteness studies research field in, in the, within the Swedish academia. And I've been doing that for a couple of years. And of course, I mean, as all of us in, in con on, I mean, continental Europe, we are, most of us are, of course, inspired by Anglo-American uh, critical race studies or critical race theory. And I'm doing this uh, because I believe that um, in the case of Sweden, which is uh, the yeah, context I'm working with mainly, um, the, there is, number one, uh, uh, a history going back to, let's say, uh, 1920s, 30s, 40s, where Sweden was heavily invested in racial thinking, and that legacy is still with us in today's Sweden. And the second reason why I believe that we have to study race in contemporary Sweden is that Sweden is today on par with the Netherlands, actually, when it comes to uh, racial diversity. Um, and not only that, uh, because I mean, diversity in itself is, well, it's not a problem in itself, but uh, there, there are um, um, uh, numerous indications that um, the, um, the inhabitants of color or non-white inhabitants in Sweden are uh, faring the worst in terms of any kinds of outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are, I mean, there's, to, to just sum it up, uh, historical reason, um, there's a kind of an, I think, obligation even to, to research race because this legacy of Swedish racial thinking. And there is also this um, uh, situation that we have today in contemporary Sweden, being a, a very multiracial uh, uh, country nowadays uh, and where um, uh, people of color are faring, are faring the worst. Mm -hmm. And you, you said that you've been working to, to integrate the such perspectives so critical race and whiteness studies in Sweden. That sounds like it, it's not yeah. a self-evident thing to do. No, no, it's not. And not even within migration studies, which is the topic that we, we are, I mean, uh, talking about here and the field that we are relating to here. Not even within uh, uh, the, the field that you might expect that uh, uh, would have been open for uh, such a, um, um, uh, yeah, operationalize, operationalizing the concept of race in the first place uh, to begin with. Mm -hmm. And this is a question, I'm going to ask it to Tobias first, but I'm really curious what Ahmad thinks about it too. How, why do you think um, it is difficult or it's not so self-evident 
for migration scholars uh, in continental Europe to mobilize studies on, on race yeah. and migration? Yeah. Uh, well, as with most other, I mean, again, continental European countries, migration studies has been uh, an um, academic field of its own. And it's uh, for, well, let's say at least 30 years, perhaps even more than that. And uh, at least, I mean, uh, since the last 15, 20 years, it's been also quite institutionalized. So there are research centers, etc., cetera. Uh, and um, there are always nowadays, um, uh, I mean, funding for migration studies uh, when uh, research councils are um, um, uh, publishing calls for, for various um, yeah, applications, etc. And uh, I, I think uh, at least when it comes to Sweden, I, I, I believe it's possibly the same with the Netherlands. There are several reasons, I would say. One is um, um, uh, uh, the fact that the migration studies itself is uh, so heavily uh, um, or closely related to, to uh, migration policy or, or the state, basically, which you just uh, heard about. Um, uh, and, and also uh, with, with, when it comes to the Netherlands, which means that the, the research questions are uh, pretty much uh, consciously or unconsciously uh, taken over by the researchers within this field um, from the state or from other, well, the state apparatus in, 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 um, in a broader sense, right? And the second uh, uh, well, problem or the second reason that I see, uh, which is a bit more, uh, well, controversial to bring up here, uh, but I do it, <laughs> bring it to the table is also, I, th I think so, the demographic makeup of, of, of the, the research field itself when it comes to the researchers. And the researchers are mainly, um, um, I would call them, at least in Sweden, most of the vast majority of those who are conducting migration studies in one way or another would most possibly self-identify as anti-racists. And the kind of anti-racist that I'm referring to in the Swedish situation is one that is against, usually against the concept of race itself, uh, according to the kind of uh, colorblindness that we are uh, uh, familiar with. As a, I mean, that's an analytical concept, right? Colorblindness, mm -hmm. uh, which has been theorized in no, not the least, for example, the US context. And and you you mentioned, you you, you call it a demographic composition of the yes. scholars? Yeah, exactly, yes. Uh, and I think that has, I mean, that has also hindered uh, the entrance of uh, the concept of race or uh, uh, within the field, uh, which might sound paradoxical because I mean, it's of course, it's a good thing that the, the vast, yeah, again, I, 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 I'm quite sure that I can claim that, that the vast majority of migration studies scholars, at least in Sweden, in Swedish academia, are for sure self-identifying as in one way or another being an anti-racist. Mm. And not then, and, and quite quite many are also politically active. Yeah, would they identify as white? You think mostly? Oh uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, mm. uh, maybe I never mentioned that, but the, the the field is basically dominated by by uh, uh, white Swedish women, uh, to 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 be exact. Uh, and that's what you see when you enter. I mean, conferences or seminar rooms. Uh, uh, centering on migration studies that that's yeah basically the people that you meet within the field yeah that's uh that people like me i recognize i recognize that image amanda what do you think do you recognize it oh wait you're still muted yeah yes so as i said i'm not um very um uh, well versed in, in migration studies so i was surprised actually that it is women in uh, in in sweden because I think predominantly it has been males in, in the Netherlands, right, Saskia? So oh. it's of course changing the field, but uh, yes, predominantly white and uh, predominantly close to, um, to, to, the, to, to the government. And, and, and as you said, Tobia, so the, you know, very easily the problems and the problem definitions of the government and, and the state would be taken over and incorporated. Uh, so that is one, and I think, I mean, of course, uh, many people have been also doing uh, good, right, uh, uh, looking for uh, yeah. 
equality among citizens, uh, job security, you know, what have you, housing and all these kind of things have been uh, addressed as well. Um, but as you say, there is, you know, there has been a problem with, with race. And I think precisely because race is very messy. So it doesn't, you know, you, don't, you never know where you will end up when you mobilize race. You never know who's going to join the conversation when you mobilize race. And this doesn't suit this kind of a slick um, uh, projects, right? And the 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 reporting, the constant reporting, you know, miles and miles and miles of reports that have been written, uh, aimed at solving the problem, mm. quick and dirty solving of the problem. So that doesn't work very well with race. And I think also uh, what I said earlier, Tobias, you were not there. I think the moment you introduce race as part of the the problem, right? Uh, you you become yourself a problem. As, uh, as a scholar, uh, uh, because mm. you trivialize yourself. You're not longer working on the mainstream of you know, the benefit of everybody, uh, but you, mm. you tend to, I mean, you're seen as particularizing the problem. And the same happened, of course, with gender studies. You know, uh, gender was a particular kind of problem. It was not across the board. It was just certain women, you know, they, had a, uh, they were loud and noisy. So you just, you know, put them in that corner. And so I think race is messy and, uh, and it causes problems for people who take it on board. And, uh, and that's not for mainstream sort of uh, research. Does that also relate no. about it to your idea of um, what you said before, this reflexive question mark that you said that, yeah. that race poses? Exactly. It's, you know, if you want to engage with race, this is also maybe consequently engaging with um, a care for a very explosive matter, right? You know what the, what the history of race has been and you know what potential futures of race uh, could be. So when you, you know, bring race state power, <laughs> talking about major uh, societal issues, this I find a quite explosive kind of thing. So you have to, and race brings this, um, you know, I, I sometimes liken it to the, to the hot potato that you have in your hand. You keep you know, you can't keep it in your hand too long. It's it's it is um, therefore it it's not an easy object. And um, so, whenever you want to engage it, you cannot but think very deeply and very thoroughly about how to do this wisely. What are the consequences? What am I doing actually? You know, what are the appropriate method for this specific situation? There is not one size fits all sort of uh, uh, approach in my in my uh, view on this so Tobias what are the ways in which um, or I don't know how to put this best um, you 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 work on, on adoption mostly right Oops. apologies noise in my house yeah um, oh sometimes yeah sometimes, yeah or you yeah. started you started working from adoption and then you brought yeah. that yeah. To migration studies. What what has that yeah. has that been like? What has it been like? Yeah, yeah. So basically, my kind of research story or CV is that I, I well, the the reason why I entered critical race studies in the first place and also migration studies was that I, after my PhD, I, I got research funding for a project on on transnational and transracial adoptees, and that would be non-white adoptees in Sweden. And I did that. Um, I approached that particular group, which I also belong to myself. I'm adopted from from South Korea, uh, 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 through the lens of, of racial discrimination, uh, because adoptees of color in Sweden as well as in the Netherlands and in any other European country, uh, it, it's a particular demographic group where the only uh, factor a variable that makes them uh, fundamentally different from the majority population is race that's nothing else than race right so it's like the perfect uh, research or object of however you want to put it and i i brought that group within two two migration studies uh, so i i i i consciously positioned myself and entered migration studies um with the adoptees uh, as my, I mean, that, that was my research project at that time. And, and uh, um, adoptees and adoption, adoption is a part of migration, right? But adoption is not seen as migration. Adoption is seen as a reproduction technique. 
basically among most people in the West, right? But adoptees are migrants uh, and there are um, at least, I mean, the, the, the obvious similarity between adoptees of color and migrants or second generation uh, uh, minorities of color is of course race. And that, that was what I wanted to, to bring into uh, Swedish migration studies. And the, the, the response was uh, either, uh, I mean, adoption is not a part of migration studies. Some people even said that openly, right? But most people did not, they, they were, I mean, they were nice, <laughs> nice people, as I said earlier, uh, uh, but uh, they didn't engage with the topic. Uh, it, they just, uh, I mean, they accepted that I, 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 I for example, I, I, I went to a couple of migration studies conferences and, and, and uh, presented on adoptees of color, trying to bring the adoptees within um, uh, migration studies. But after I finished that project, I don't think anyone has continued to do that. So uh, today, yeah, I'm pretty sure that, I mean, again, still today, most my people, whether it's within or outside of the Swedish academia would not connect adoption and adoptees to migration or migrants because they don't see this. I mean, they, they don't, they are not interested in that. I mean, again, it's race, right? Yeah. Could you, I, um, I'm getting some qu questions from the from the Q&A, very selected questions, but maybe for the both of you, um, for, for scholars who are, who are trying to work on migration or on, on what you called multiracial uh, societies before Tobias, don't know whether Ahmad would use the same <laughs> terminology. Um, um, how, what kind of advice would you have for people who are trying to study these kinds of issues in, in a context where the question was like, when we can't even address race, like when we can't mm. Uh, mm. name it, this is a very difficult question I realize, but what would you tell them to be asked first? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, if you are, let's say you're a PhD student or PhD, yeah, on, on a PhD level, it becomes, of course, problematic because you're totally dependent on your supervisors and on the whole kind of research environment that you uh, are a part of as a PhD student. And it's not very easy if you want to, let's say you want to operationalize race in some way or another, can also be in relation to, I mean, the concept of racialization, et cetera, or everyday racism, whatever, and you already do migration studies. But if you are, um, um, I mean, if you have a PhD, if you are, a, I mean, a scholar, a researcher, um, uh, even though you are, uh, I mean, you are a researcher, you, uh, if you want to, let's say, um, uh, get funding for a project where, which explicitly would, would deal with some migrants and race or migration and race. Um, uh, it, yeah, I mean, basically you have to re rephrase um, um, such an application to get funding, I think, because that, that's what, at least until recently, that's what people did in Sweden that wanted to do some kind of research on, on race and races. They had to talk about well, you can maybe at the most you maybe maybe you can mention skin color as a as a variable or as a factor. You can probably focus on let's say um, uh, Afro Swedes or Black Swedes it would be I mean an, um, an obvious demographic group to focus on uh, because um, um, I mean it's quite obvious that you have to take in race in some way or another. Um, but it's it's very it's very difficult. Um, yeah, the, speaking from my own experiences. Yeah. What would you say, Ahmad, to, to this? Very hard question indeed, uh, Saskia. And uh, I mean that 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 part of the, you know the applications uh, mm -hmm. uh, for funding. Uh, I think Tobias, you you tackled that very well. I was actually thinking, you know, I. Um, I mean, there is a choice. Would you like to be in the field or would you like to be at the border of the field? Uh, you know, uh, because there's also, I think nowadays, some possibilities, you know, first you, you can connect with international colleagues uh, and you can, uh, you can connect with colleagues from other 
adjacent fields uh, and to build your own network of peers. Of course, uh, it comes with 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 a price. Uh, people might overlook your work, and uh, it might take some time before it lands somewhere or before people start to refer to your work. Uh, but I mean, I think. Um, um, but I tend to be very stubborn, you know, when I want to study something, I just make it happen and, uh, and then you create, you, you create your own um, uh, uh, infrastructure, so to speak, to, uh, to do that. But of course, this is maybe also um, thanks to our university, where people are not looking very precisely on what you have to do. I mean, I know for settings where it is really the professor or the head of department that really co-determines actually where the research should be going, you know, think of the ref in the UK and what have you. So um, it is also thanks to a relative freedom that we can sort of uh, juggle and, and figure out a way and create an interesting uh, group of peers around our research uh, that can be, make it viable in a sense and interesting. Uh, and I'm very much for that because I think this is often where uh, novel things can happen and uh, mm -hmm. encounters and novel ideas and uh, methodologies. Yeah. I've, I've just uh, been posed a very interesting question in the, in the, in the chat uh, asking, uh, or in the Q&A, whether, um, so we've been talking about migration scholars um, uh, uh, re reaching out or striving to mobilize um, race studies and the, and the resistance to that within migration studies or within institutions more broadly. But here's a question of whether there's also pushback by critical race scholars who do not want to be tied uh, with migration studies for many of the reasons that you mentioned before. Mm. Tobias, go ahead. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, well, um... So again, I mean, I can only refer, I mean, that's why I'm here, right? I, I, I always refer to Sweden because yeah, that's the, the kind of academic community that I know. And um, it's, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not the only uh, researcher in Sweden doing some kind of critical race studies who has been uh, within migration studies and who, who is not within migration studies anymore. So there are others who have kind of drifted away from that field uh, because either they were, yeah, well, I cannot speak for, for them, but uh, I'm, sh I, I'm the people that I think of, which um, they, they would probably say that, uh, yeah, uh, once I was with immigration studies, because maybe that's how I entered the academic field in the first place, maybe my PhD project was connected to some, I don't know, senior scholar with immigration studies somewhere, uh, but then uh, uh, I, I just stayed there for a while because uh, there was no opening or there was no room basically for uh, doing critical race studies within migration studies. So it, it, uh, instead, I mean, the people that I think of, um, uh, I say, yeah, they, 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 I mean, the field that I think most of the people, I'm, I'm thinking about maybe five, 10 names now, they, you will find them nowadays within gender studies mainly. If, if you would, I mean, find them anywhere in a kind of a coherent field, a, a research field. Um, so the, the kind of, it, well, <laughs> I'm speaking about so, there are so few names, right? But to, yeah, so maybe it's not right to call it a tendency, but anyway, that's, yeah. So, so let's say those names that, that I'm thinking about they have basically went from migration studies to gender studies. Uh, how would you explain the move, that move? Yeah, because gender studies is more open to, I mean, gender studies is a critical project that from the beginning was also connected to a social movement, the women's movement, as maybe especially in Sweden, but I think elsewhere as well. Sure. And it was, uh, um, and nowadays, gender studies is institutionalized in Sweden, but it is still very much connected to, yeah, social movement. Yeah. And uh, because of that, there is, uh, um, I mean, if there is anywhere uh, within the academic world, at least in Sweden, where there is an opening for critical race and whiteness studies, it is within gender studies. And the reason for that is, yeah, it's becomes like, yeah, um, um, yeah, yeah, the reason for that is basically that, um, I mean, it, it's obvious that if you if you 
come from, I mean, a feminist movement uh, or uh, women's movement, fem whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, of course, you 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 immediately, I mean, see the parallel, right? When it comes to anti-racism, it's it's obvious, mm -hmm. uh, which you don't see within migration studies. And Ahmad, what would you say? I mean, I'm interested in your take on the on the connection between gender, migration, and race studies, but also in this, uh, the question that we started with about um, critical race scholars um, pushing, pushing back from connecting with uh, migration studies. I, I mean, I can, of course, I can relate to that. And given these institutional histories that we have been sketching here, both in Sweden and in the Netherlands, right? If uh, there is such a consolidation of power and money and uh, uh, certain types of research in one place that is so unhospitable, so to speak, for certain uh, uh, takes, uh, certain scholarly work for certain questions. Of course, you become a sort of, uh, yeah, you keep that at, uh, at, a, at a distance. But still, I mean, I couldn't help thinking of um, a couple of years, I don't remember, three years ago or so, where we had uh, a conference here organized by EMIS, where uh, Philomena Asset was speaking, uh, David Goldberg was speaking. Uh, so these are, you know, the critical race studies that are very important uh, or, you know, have a, uh, an important place here in the Netherlands. And uh, two years ago, um, we organized a, a Spy 25 event where Alana Lenting was uh, uh, speaking exactly on this migration and, and, and race issue. What's the use of race in migration studies? What's the title? So um, I see that despite this kind of anxiety or, or anxiousness and maybe even um, problem with migration studies and its history, its legacy, uh, there is still a, a need or a will to have the conversation. Um, so this is what I had been observing as well. Yeah. yeah, I think I think connected to that, there's a question about a possible possible change uh, and, and, and increasing openness. Uh, Dvora Janov, who has known the Netherlands and the Dutch research scene for a long time. So she's asking in particular um, about your experience, Amade, and how it contrasts with that of Philomena Esset. So, so Professor Esset left the Netherlands, right? That's, that's how she, that's her, that was her way of being uh, obstinate about what she wanted to study. Uh, she, she found a space where she could do so. Um, and you stayed here and you did. Um, <laughs> yeah, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, thank you. Life, Laura. life stories. But yeah, what do you think? Um, I mean, there is, of course, a lot that can be said about this. Hi, Dvora, by the way. I don't see you, but. Um, so I think, I mean, Philomena was, of course, here. Um, very important historical moments, right? So. Uh, um, the feminist movement, second wave, where Zwarte um, Migrante uh, so Black and migrant women, uh, you know, started to uh, make uh, noise, you know, what, you know, there's not women, but women, <laughs> right? Uh, so that, that was one of the first uh, fights. And then the, ne the next is, of course, this institutionalization of critical race studies. And um, so I think she, she, there's, there was this, um, uh, the brick wall, so to speak, that she kept moving into, and I can uh, imagine that there's that comes with lots of frustration, where you just think, well, thank you very much, I'm out of here, uh, and and we, you know, we benefited from that for, as as the next generation. There is a gender studies, you know, de not department, uh, but uh, a group here at was at the University of Amsterdam, and. Uh, um, so I did not myself feel the need for immediate institu institutionalization. I was focused on the ball of, you know, doing the research and, or, and the teaching on this issue and simply did not look up like, should we have an institute or something or a center initially, right? Uh, so, um, so these are differences and um, yeah. And of course, there's also biograph biographic, bi biographies. Um, issues that have an impact on what you do as a scholar, we're humans. Yeah, life trajectories, huh? Yes. Yeah. So there's another question on 
Oh, another difficult question. All the questions are good and very difficult. Um, how do you how do you think about um, um, anti anti what, what's in the question is called possible parallels between anti Muslim and anti black racism. Um, and how do you how do you how would you study or compare differences and similarities between these uh, forms of racialization. Um, Tobias, maybe is that is that yeah. something you can say? Yeah. Yeah, but I can say something because I'm 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 being uh, yeah, I, I've been involved in anti-black races and also in anti-Muslim races. Um and both as a I mean researchers and activists, I would say also. So uh, and and the the yeah, I mean demographically speaking, because we can begin there, right? Uh, um at least when it we speak about Sweden, uh, 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 um, a quite substantial proportion of uh, Swedish Muslims are uh, black Swedes. So they are basically black Muslims, right? And uh, uh, I'm mainly speaking about people from the Horn of Africa now. And it's not only Somalia, but it's very much Somalia uh, uh, as a country of origin. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, when Muslims are brought up in the discourse in Sweden, um, there is already a kind of a racialization in this uh, going on is in the sense that uh, uh, I would uh, not everybody, but the kind of general view on who is the Muslim basically is pretty much um, um, uh, a black uh, or sub-Saharan African Muslim. Um, so that would be, I mean, uh, an obvious connection in the in, in the case of Sweden. It might be different in the Netherlands because you have another demographic makeup. I think you have uh, a quite substantial minority coming from Morocco, for example, or and, and also Indonesia, right? So it would it would be different from country to country, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Amada, would you would you speak to that question from the Dutch context? Yes, I mean, I, the, yes, it is slightly different here demographically. It is open and right. Uh, so people from Morocco and Turkey, uh, uh, Indonesia. Um, I'm trying to think really, uh, I mean, parallels in the, the, the way these groups get ra racialized, I would say uh, uh, for Muslims, it's much more through sexual rep reproduction, uh, sexuality, you know, uh, violence. Uh, uh, whereas uh, people of color are sort of, um, there is, I feel this kind of mobilization of evolutionary thinking, you know, the ranking of people uh, on this ladder, so to speak, that is a very obvious place for certain kinds of people. Whereas, uh, you know, if, if we look at the, uh, the, the recent uh, terror attacks here in Europe, you see this very clearly. And also the migration, so-called migration crisis, uh, the sexualization of these men that are coming here. Uh, uh, I found that very, very uh, stunning. So, uh, I, I, so this is where I tend to focus on, like, how do people, how, how are people racialized, you know, and what does it take to make them into a group that can be sort of identified and that, that is a group that also is frightening or othering, othered or, uh, you know, to be excluded or to be, yeah. So I think sexuality is, is really, and, and sexual reproduction is really uh, uh, the way uh, anti-Muslim racism uh, uh, is done. Plus violence, not, you know, with with this terrorist issues. Maybe we have Everything. yeah, <laughs> super short answer to a super short, uh, super big question. I know you'd have much more to say about it, but I'm, I'm there's a there's a um, another question about decolonial and postcolonial studies and perspectives and where where they fit in in, in this in this question of uh, of race studies and migration studies. Tobias, I see you nodding. <laughs> mm -hmm. what, what, do you, what do you think? Yeah, well, um, yeah, yeah I, again, I, at least when it comes to Sweden, I mean, um, the, the, the entrance of race within the Swedish academia came with post-colonial studies. So post-colonial studies came before critical race studies. 
no one, I mean, very, very few people at least make I think we're losing the connection. In any kind of uh, terrorist let's go, they say that they would do post-colonial studies. Um, you, you hear me? Yes, now we hear okay, you. Okay, still yes. hear me? Yeah, and and and, and uh, um, so so that that I mean so the kind of if we would um, kind of genealogy of the field is that um, first post-colonial studies came, uh, but and then critical race studies and the people who are doing critical race studies come from post-colonial studies basically. Uh, so that's, that would be the relationship, at least when it comes to the Swedish case. Um, yeah. Do you, do you mobilize post-colonial and decolonial theorizations, Ahmad? Um, I, I mean, I am learning, I must say, about decolonial perspectives. I'll say something about it shortly, but the post-colonial is at the center. I mean, I... Uh, in the sense that the idea of decentering the subject as well as the object of research is uh, is important. The idea of temporality that is at the heart of post-colonial thinking, uh, post-colonial studies is uh, is key because you know if you want to understand race, you cannot do without uh, relating to the history of race and race making. So and and how that is not in a linear way in the past, but really in a very complicated way here, right? So I, th I, I, I find post-colonial studies key and important uh, there. So when it comes to decoloniality, I, uh, for me, that is really a, a methodology of uh, thinking reflexively about how we go about our, about our business. How do we teach? How do we do the research? Um, uh, where are we situated in, uh, in that? And, uh, and I feel still very crippled, I must say, in how to mobilize other ways of worlding, other ways of thinking, other uh, literature, other insights. And um, so it's, it's, it's really uh, infant baby steps. So a last question, perhaps, on the, on the, um, on the specificity of, of continental Europe in this regard. So that's my question, like what, what how do you think this is specific to to European Europe as a geographical and and uh, an academic space? And then related to that, the, the question that uh, one someone in the audience asked is, what do we do with this continental European provincialism when it comes mm -hmm. to the non-thinking of racialization and its product of race? So we can critique the provincialism. The the yeah. question uh, the person who's asking the question says, but and we must critique it. But this person also feels that this critique can potentially bind us to the status quo. So mm. ways ways forward, I think, bypassing the provincialism. Mm. Um, yeah. Can, can I say something very short about the Swedish situation? And also maybe I can say something about the kind of, let's call it pan-European, and uh, except for Great Britain or British eyes, right? Because that, that, that's more the angle of home world. Um, so I, I mean, this is like what what I see, right? And 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 also in connection to to uh, the Black Lives Matter movement last year, I I what I see is actually a a, um, a strengthening of a kind of this kind of colorblind ideology. Uh, and let's take the example of Germany. Maybe there are no Germans here now, but anyway, those who are familiar with the debate on on the concept of race in the German speaking uh, uh, context or that would be continent, very much continent, Central Europe or continental Europe. And there is this, um, uh, I mean, upcoming uh, possible decision to remove race uh, from, from German official texts and legislation, et cetera. And there's also, uh, I mean, again, uh, maybe there are some people from France here, but anyway, that uh, what you saw during the Black Lives Matter movement in France, as well as in Germany was uh, uh, even stronger as a kind of response, which is kind of weird, right? But this again, provincialism is the best uh, word for it. Um, as an even stronger kind of uh, demand to remove, uh, because there, there's also a pending decision going on in, in France to remove the concept of race, and also uh, an, an outright attack on critical race studies as 
being some kind of a, um, a threat to European as itself. Um, and and that, that kind of uh, um, uh, discourse is very strong in Sweden also as a response, again, a paradoxical response to Black Lives Matter and, and uh, what this usually, I mean, um, uh, called nowadays identity politics, right? Uh, so it, it's a, uh, it it yeah. So, well, that that was maybe not a positive note, but that that's what I see, unfortunately. So claiming a European exceptionalism in this colorblind, colorblind response. Yeah. 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 And becoming about? even stronger. Okay. Yeah. Mm. And becoming even stronger in spite of Black Lives Matter movement, which was also quite st strong in certain, I mean, places mm -hmm. in Europe. There were mm -hmm. quite big demonstrations in Sweden, for example. I saw there were demonstrations in the Netherlands also, right? And in, in Paris, there was a huge one. But in spite of that, um, you see this stronger uh, tendency towards colorblindness as a weird provincial response and to, to yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think, Amar? I mean, I, I, uh, just to hook into this this uh, this response of um, um, uh, verstärkt uh, enforcing nationalisms and uh, Eurocentrisms. Um, yes, we see that happening, but I think you know the issue of um, European provincialism is, uh, of course, it is there, but we are not done with Europe yet when it comes to race. This is a particular place uh, that has um, uh, such a heritage, you know, an ugly heritage when it comes to race science that lots of work needs to be done still. Um, but, yeah. but, yeah. I, I think we can't say, well, let's leave Europe and go elsewhere and, and just take an, another perspective, so to speak. Um, but we do need these other perspectives. So it is really important uh, um, to think creatively about how to do this. It can happen here in Europe, but we have to look at the, you know, at the edges, so to speak, of uh, where things are happening. So, right, so that the places that are not so in your face and shouting at you and so on, to find some interesting questions uh, there. But also, um, what I find really important is, um, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not there. Yet, so this is really also to me, how to, um, um, uh, how to have conversations with people uh, from outside of Europe, uh, outside of the US, obviously as well, uh, because this is where uh, science and academia is uh, so incredibly dominant. Uh, so how to do that, how to engage our colleagues from elsewhere, how to be uh, talking from uh, with activists that are elsewhere in the world, rather than just here in this European context. So we, we, are, we have to do this, these two things, like uh, really take Europe seriously in this, uh, with this legacy and how it is keeping reproducing that, uh, that system of exclusion. And at the same time, uh, try to learn from, from uh, histories that are elsewhere and uh, uh, that have had different dynamics uh, from the European one. And this is, this is, I think, a very difficult task, but yes, we are stuck with Europe. We can't, we can't just leave the, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. The boat. Decenter it and, and center it and problematize it at the same time. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm, I can see that there's so many more questions and I myself would also just love to, what I would really love now is for us to go to Crea Cafe, which is on Rutos Island <laughs> campus and have a glass of wine <laughs> together and continue the conversation. That's what I would most want, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep that for another time. Um, so for now, I thank you both for this conversation. Thank you. And I hand the floor back to- thank you. Hi again, uh, thank you so much for your contributions, for all the insights you so willingly have shared with everyone today and thank you to everyone who have asked questions in the Q&A and who uh, take time out of their day to explore these topics with us. Um, next time, um, we will gather on the 25th of March, um, the same time, so 4 to 5, the Central European time, 
with uh, Alyosha Tudor uh, from SOAS, who will talk about, uh, who will give a keynote on race, queerness, and trans feminism in European migration studies. We are also putting together a reading list um, for all the sessions. So those of you who want to can read along and kind of get a introduction to uh, bridging racial and migration studies in your own work, because some of you have also asked for that specifically. So thank you so much uh, again to Amade, to Vias, and to the audience. Thank you, Saskia, for moderating this so well. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.